glad you're all here. This is sort of part two. So we were kind of chugging along, and you know, there was a pandemic. Um, and uh, we were chugging along a little more. Uh, we were able to do a little work in the in between. Um, and then we were able to get funding to hire a consultant, Stan Tech, to work with us on this process. This is kind of part two. Um, there was an initial session with what we call stakeholders, um, boards and committees, business owners. This is our first big public meeting that we're, and it's lasting all day, so trying to accommodate as many people as possible. And there will be a follow-up to this, um, which will be more of a, um, you know, what direction do we want to go in? Um, so this is really uh, all about, you know, getting ideas. And so I'm going to introduce Jason Schreiber, who is our consultant. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Somebody please take pictures of this room. There's turnout. There's folks here. You're all interested in the future of downtown Sunderland. I'm going to move this out of the way because I don't want it to look like it's a podium presentation. Um, in the end, it's a conversation. And I think that's kind of the point of today is that we're all here to sort of understand what can and can't happen. It's a vision for the future uh, of your village center. Uh, I am going to talk for a little bit, though, because one of the things in talking with the folks on the center committee that they thought was really helpful was going to be to sort of explain why there are numbers on boards and lines on maps and what does that all mean. And I think oftentimes folks, and, and when we were here for our kickoff conference, um, you know, they develop impressions about what the future might be based on their own experience. And what we're trying to do is share with you the experience of as many people as possible and as many perspectives on getting around as possible. Um, and as Lauren said, you know, we came, um, after we pulled together some information, um, you know, we came out originally in the fall for sort of a, a kickoff conference. And that was really just when we were here to listen. Um, and we heard from a lot of folks, and I'll, I'll summarize that in a minute. Um, but we're at this point now, and we're calling this a workshop, so that we can hear from you what you all like and don't like and what may work and what doesn't work, because we're going to then pull that together and try to create a document, a vision document that's yours, um, that is a representation of what you think the village center, at least from a roadway perspective, but we're also going to try to talk a little bit about future land uses, what that may look like for you. Um, folks, there are a few chairs in the front if you want to. I, I don't bite that much, that's why I moved the podium. I could put the podium back if we want the barrier, but I'll try not to step on your toes. So when we came out in the fall, we had a lot of background. So you all had, and as Lauren mentioned, it kind of stalled your process, but it actually helped things. Uh, there was a rapid recovery plan that was produced, um, and that was done through uh, a grant from the state. Lots of communities participated in these. A lot of good data was pulled in. Um, these plans were sort of a foundation setting for communities to be able to take a look at things. And that plan for your village center was already hearing what a lot of folks were saying about your main intersection. You know, can that look different? How should that look different? What can you do quickly in paint was this suggestion, and what might you be able to do sort of in the long term, acknowledging that there might be some extra space, but we also know there's lots of cars, and how should it all be designed? And honestly, folks really had some good intent and good ideas. You know, that's a sort of a, a good background for us, but I think that the biggest thing that it was talking about was making things walkable, pedestrian friendly. Village vitality is what that plan talked about. So um, when we came back out and, or came out for our first time in the fall, it was on the 15th, um, we met with stakeholders right in the village center. Um, we met with the select board. We did our own observations and all. Um, and in that process, you know, we asked people to look at maps and mark things up and tell us what worked. And we scheduled a lot of sort of one-on-one -on -one conversations. And we heard from folks a, a lot of legitimate concerns that the rapid recovery plan identified. And I think you're familiar with these. Speeding is always a concern. Um, Route 116 is designed pretty wide. And cars can go pretty fast these days. And it is definitely a concern. And speed, as I'll discuss shortly, is, is not good for a pedestrian-friendly center. Um, you know, it, 
the right turns on red. Uh, you know, there's signs up there that can say it, not always there maintained, hadn't always been there in the past, debate over whether it's needed. Um, but yes, cars turning right across a crosswalk can be a threat at an intersection and ultimately that was a big concern. Now, there's not a ton of people at your main intersection, but they are there. I mean, in just the short time that we were there, we have videos of folks walking across, kids trying to bike across. You've got a lot of activities actually in what is a relatively small and not high density area, which is a very, very good thing. And, and a lot of concern therefore had to do with all the traffic, which can sometimes queue up. And how does that affect things? Not just the pedestrians, but getting into parcels. I think this thing on the right is really important because we heard this repeatedly, is that people really said, we'd love to do a little bit of growth and expansion. We'd love to be able to make our lands work better, but it's hard with this traffic. You know, we have a, an a place with such a great natural environment. We're so close to the river. There's a lot of recreational activities. There's outfitters, there's bicycling, even to the local schools. And yet, you know, how does that make our village center have an identity? It isn't known by most who just blow right on through. And, and ultimately, preserving the aesthetic character of the village center and making a lot of folks like me, who years ago I went to UMass and I blew through on 116 like everybody else too and didn't even half the time look left or right to see the historic character along 47. So, you know, when we sat down in the public meeting that evening, those same themes came up. And really, you know, it's important, I think, to just simply say, you're all aligned on these concerns. Whether it's your boards, whether it's local residents, certainly, whether it's landowners, I think you all see the problem. And that's important to know. It's the first step in actually trying to find a solution. So I'm going to spend, uh, we'll try to keep it to 20 minutes talking through some fundamentals about transportation and land use and how they work. And it really comes down to the basics of what our streets are actually all about. Because when you think about that as a front door to your community, it is actually one of the most important front doors. It isn't so much that it's there for moving people, it's there for creating this space. It's amazing when you think about it. You know, as soon as, if you, if you draw the big circle around your village center, there's lots of nice rural, but as soon as you get to that walkable core, the primary open space is the roadway. That's like, in big cities, that is the primary open space. In your village center, in a short walk, that is the primary open space. But, you know, we also need to think about what that space is doing. You know, it, it isn't about cars as much as it's about jobs and, and opportunities for people. It isn't about cars as much as it is about supporting retail and vitality along a street, which is something that you're all talking about. And it isn't about cars, it's recognizing that streets are ecosystems of sorts. And it's tough when you've got a lot of cars and the edge of that is you know just a shoulder and it's rough paving and it's a it's a difficult environment so when we look at a street you know we recognize that you have to move vehicles but it's first and foremost about moving people but in truth other than you know adding some parked cars it's about so many more things your street is about interaction whether it's done in a car or on foot or on bike or even on a bus it could be in a big truck getting through that's about interaction, it's about commerce, it's about place, it's about the things that make streets messy. You know, all the stuff that's happening on a sidewalk, this is Amherst, is all the different modes and all the different people and services that interact on a regular basis. These are all what you want in a street. Not the cars, it's the people. It's the things that you're trying to do, but when you are continuously focused on what you should be, which is yourselves, which is people, that's when street design sometimes works at odds with the goal of what a village center might be. One of the more fundamental issues we have in traffic engineering, and still today in traffic engineering, as much as the trade has advanced, is that traffic engineers 
Look at this as a good thing. They give this a letter grade. Level of service, L-O-S-A. This is an A, right? But from a vitality perspective, certainly from an economist's perspective, this is a disaster because you're just blown right through. Whereas a traffic engineer looks at this as a total failure. This is horrible. People have to wait in their cars. But it's slow and people are seeing things and there's activity. And from a vitality and certainly an economic perspective, that's a very, very good thing. The other thing that engineers are not very good at is understanding speed and the relationship that speed has. So this is an extremely old diagram, which is 100% still true today. On a roadway like 116, if somebody is even getting close to these higher speeds, your vision narrows up. Your eye, which is always only focused on the very center of your vision at any one time, cannot focus on enough peripheral. And you sort of have a cone effect, whether you realize it or not, at speed. That cone effect goes away, gets much wider at a lower speed. And when you have a field of vision that's much wider at a more reasonable speed, that's what leads to safety. People being able to brake effectively, people being able to react effectively. But then there's this other side of that. We don't want cars just to go slower so that they can react and they can see things. We want cars to go slower so they don't kill people. You're a water bag. Every single one of you is 80% or so water. Just take a water balloon with your kids and throw it against the wall, a little bit harder and harder, it'll burst. You don't even need to get it much over 25 miles an hour before that water balloon will burst. You work the same way. And so as soon as you start to break above about 25 miles an hour, these numbers start to become a fatal street in every situation. And you know, you're, you're there. Basically, you step out onto 116 today, it's an 80% chance of death without something that slows that driver down, warns them, gets them to stop. That's not a village center compatible type of environment. One of the real truths of traffic engineering that hasn't ever been expressed enough is that as you get the street wider, the speed goes up. And when I look at the width of 116, you know, it's, whoops, it's over here, right? It's 64 feet wide at intersections and 42 feet wide the rest of the way for just two lanes of travel. It's really wide. It basically is designed to encourage speeding. And while it may be needed for regional traffic, which I'll share with you in a little while, it isn't needed to blow folks through the village center at high speeds. Now, there's lots of communities who've creatively dealt with this with very, very inexpensive treatments. This is an example of a place that had a wide street that was way more than 42 feet, but it effectively works much narrower because they painted in large bike lanes. That was dirt cheap, but it completely changed the look of their downtown. So believe it or not, your DOT knows this stuff. Your DOT, which you know, a lot of folks have said, oh, they're gonna come in and do something. And we've heard about the roundabout and the intersection and all this kind of stuff. Your DOT has actually been well ahead of the curve. Back in 2006, they were one of the only DOTs in the country to even have a complete streets design manual. They've started a complete streets funding program. What is complete streets? Streets that accommodate all modes of transportation and are cognizant of what I just talked about. Cognizant of the need to do things like narrowing lanes. MassDOT has examples where they've gone out and narrowed lanes and added sidewalks. They've done this in village centers. Arlington is a great example where, you know, it was a fine street, but it was Mass Ave, it was way too wide. And they said, look, this is what we can do. And successfully today, that's what it is. Narrower lanes, a multimodal street, and they've even added bus lanes into this since that happened. We know that the tools and the ability the skill sets are out there, but we still have to go beyond just narrowing things up. Many downtowns work successfully at a narrow width like this. Big trucks, cars, only 20 feet, 10 foot lanes. No, what do we got, 15 and 14 foot lanes out there? I don't remember. Like really wide on 116 and 
47 is honestly not much better. So you can operate on 10-foot lanes easily. But one of the problems is if you don't have the friction that you saw in that picture, you can still get pretty fast, 38 miles an hour in this radar gun example, on a pretty narrow street. So there's other tools of the trade, and that's part of what this workshop here today is to get you to think about are things that people have done temporarily in paint or permanently, things like curb extensions that narrow it up, add some landscaping, create some sort of what we call friction that gets a car to slow down and think about the place they're in. In some places, take that friction and extend it all the way down the width of a street. Being able to take what is actually a very wide right of way, I think it's 75 feet of right of way, and add things that get people to think differently about that space. One of the easiest things to add is parking. Most village centers have on-street parking, which you do a little bit of on 47, and absolutely none of that on 116. And everyone's like, oh, the DOT won't allow on-street parking. There's tons of examples of on-street parking on DOT-maintained roadways. When it comes to being a cheap way to create safe streets, it's an effective tool. These are fine countermeasures. These are things that folks will do. It's been talked about. We're going to ask you to say, hey, I'd like to have this maybe or not. But I would prefer not to have to go to an elaborate solution for a single crosswalk when I can make a better realm. And a lot of those things can be cheap. Like I can put in crossing islands that make it very clear to folks that there's a refuge. And as a car, I have to slow down and avoid those things. I can make just the crosswalks become so much more visible and maybe add more of them so that it's not just at the intersection that you can safely cross, but it's at other locations along 116, and they can look pretty as well. You know, this is just, again, Amherst down the road. They spent time making these things work. You can do that too. And a lot of places have used cycling infrastructure as a way to achieve those goals. Cycling infrastructure is really interesting because you actually have a large cycling community in the Pioneer Valley, especially on weekends that's going everywhere. And they're just biking on the roads. And luckily, everybody generally knows it and slows down, but not all the time. And at rush hour, they wouldn't want to do it unless they're really comfortable. You want to create facilities for people of all ages and abilities. And what's nice is on a wide road like 116, you can just put it in right away. Now, as part of this, though, and as part of what we're trying to do, we want folks to think about all the other stuff that you can do to that corridor. All the other visiony, smart things, signs, wayfinding, landscaping, baskets, lighting, all of this stuff is important. And all these things can be a part of your village center. And we all want you to start thinking about what those things can look like. One of the primary things in any environment that we always have to think about is the trade-off of space that we're giving to each one of these modes. And I think those trade-offs are fundamental to how you would go about changing your streets. You know, this is a good multimodal environment down the road in Amherst, but you can see that some things have a lot more space, and some of them need it. A bus needs more space. But the sidewalk's pretty narrow. It's still active because they're accommodating everything. There's bike lanes. One of the fundamental truisms, which isn't really even an engineering thing, it's just a, any old calculation of space, is that transit and then walking are the top two highest, most efficient ways of moving people. It is not the automobile. We like the automobile. The automobile's nice and fast, but there are so many better ways of getting people around. And this is, these are great little images that they put together in Seattle to help illustrate this concept. You know, we look at a street as jammed, right? You know, we look at a street as, oh my gosh, like look at that entire field of view. Traffic gridlock. It's only serving about 200 people. Like if you think about it, and you stand at an intersection, if you're waiting to cross, you're sometimes waiting for a car or two to go by. If you're with your friend, they were only half of the equation. The other half is you waiting to cross that street. And so there's, this is why folks are saying you can put those 200 people in just a single lane. Or you can put them all seated friendly together on a few buses. 
The reason for doing those efficiencies goes beyond just getting folks around more effectively, more equitably, and under a complete streets approach. It's actually significantly cheaper to be doing that. One of the most important things that we never understand about driving is that most of everything else in our world is there to pay for it and it's a hidden cost. It's a hidden cost in getting things shipped to me. It's a hidden cost in the things that you buy. It's a hidden cost in the vast majority of emergency responses by fire and police. It's a hidden cost in all the stuff that you have to build every time you want another subdivision with too wide a roadway. It's a hidden cost to the environment. Most of the things that we have to do to mitigate for in terms of drainage and all that stuff are because of the accommodation of the car and the user never pays for it. And that's why as we start to look to the future, and especially in an environment like this, and I think in Sunderland much like the rest of the Pioneer Valley, these types of things ring true. And I think we're at a point in a place like the Village Center where we need to think about how can you start to take the desirability of a vehicle that goes around and does everything you want, but unfortunately takes all the nice features you have from your home and combines them. People will go to their car to hang out and listen to the radio. There's even been ads on TV and during the Super Bowl about how wonderful it is to escape the family in your car. We've gone nuts. <laughs> but we know how to do it right. We know how to design streets and downtowns right. We know how to make them safe for everybody, walking, driving, biking. And, and these, this is a street that's been retrofit in a way that maybe your roadway could be retrofit. This one's mostly done in paint, and it's a real change in the thinking and the philosophy, but you know what it does? It makes everybody slow down a little bit and respect each other and get around. We all know how to do this. There's so many manuals and designs out there. I always like to talk about NACTO's Urban Streets Design Guide. You can just get on the internet and find these things. There's so much guidance. The DOTs are even now behind the curve because the federal government released its new manual on uniform traffic control devices that is also reflective of a lot of these principles. The future is about skinny streets. The future is about this basic acknowledgement that I've been trying to hammer home. They're not about moving cars. Streets are about public places and first and foremost, the safety of people. And second, the opportunities for all of these communities. When you're spending billions of dollars a year on roadways and they're not necessarily helping the local economy, you need to rethink the approach. And that's what the federal government has been thinking about. And that's why they've changed their approach. And they've acknowledged that, you know, you can completely, this is Texas. If Texas can do this, you can do this. In fact, I just held another community in Texas do exactly this. And, and in the end, this kind of a narrow street, this type of a character, which is a total retrofit of a street that had originally been narrow and then went wide and is back narrow again, is exactly what people want to live in. And NACTO espouses a fundamental that I think works really well in Sunderland, which is that you can use things, bio basins and stuff like that, but you can use the natural environment to help to create that slow environment, to help to create that recognition that there's gonna be people in a place here. And so that over time, remember, you can start to think about integrating elements into your center. This doesn't happen overnight. You can rebuild a sidewalk, but that alone doesn't make it happen. You've got to think a little bit about land development too. Land development will follow. Some folks will be like, oh, well now that Sunderland cares, we're gonna you know, build whatever is needed and we're gonna come along and that creates some level of activity, at least at a node. And what is that? That's a significantly slower street. But I need to talk about this because there is 100% of fear in this room of adding any new development in your town. Don't want that. It's got the worst thing possible. So I wanna just do some educating about what density really is or isn't. And most people are afraid of the word density, they just take it head on. So this is a beautiful downtown. 
Does anybody know which one this was? It still exists today. That's what it looks like today. That's Tulsa. Could be anywhere in America. Could have been Springfield. The point is that we started legislating land use starting in the 20s and roaring right after the war in the 50s. Like crazy, lots of things from what you can and can't do to how many parking spaces you can provide. And as soon as we took away what the free economy wanted to do and said, no, only things can happen, our streets have to be this way, we actually killed tons and tons of downtowns. We started creating things like this. Subdivisions didn't exist until planners, my predecessors, not me, <laughs> came around and said, oh, this is what you can do. You can put only residential here. You can only put retail here. And boom, the mall was born overnight. You can only put certain things in certain spaces. And by the way, they each need to have their own field of parking because that's the new great thing. It's the 50s, everybody's getting a car. And boy, did we pave over our world. So this is a, a random shot. I think it's in Windsor, Connecticut, but again, could be anywhere. Up there's the residential zone. Down there's a, a commercial retail zone. Over here, these are like industrial zones. And then they got a little bit of other kind of uh, uh, main, light manufacturing separating out the agricultural. Like it's all these different zones that exist in this community. And that's not a natural land use pattern. That's not what... If you looked at a map of Europe, they just you know, things grow organically before anybody even thought of these controls. And then we get to this ridiculous embarrassment. This is Florida. There's a house. There's a house, right? I want a, I want a cup of sugar over from Frank's house. Okay, well, there's fences, right? So instead, I got to do something else. I got to get in my car. <laughs> no joke. Seven mile drive to the house directly behind. And, and people will look at this on an area and they're like, oh, that's dense. This is not dense, this is horrible. This is not what you want. This is the kind of thing that ruins communities and we need to get away from it. This is an example I love. So let's say we've got an arterial like, oh, I don't know, Route 116. And along that arterial, this is a fictional example, we got a school, we got a shopping center, we got a workplace, and a soccer field. So let's say I, I live nearby, um, I want to get here, I can only get there by, you know, parking, right? Because everybody's got their parking out front usually. And so I'll drive in, and I'm dropping off my daughter at school, and then uh, I got to drive to my job down the road. And then I got to pick her up at school, take her over to soccer practice, run over to the grocery store to pick up food for that night, um, pick her up at, from soccer practice and then go home, okay? So when I did all that stuff, one of the things that I did was create all these turning movements on 116. All those things are a source of traffic, danger, conflict, etc. But in a village center, like you have or are close or could have, there's one thing is, it's like some other streets. There's some level of connection. You've got those uses kind of near each other and the parking is all kind of near each other. And when you put that all together, I can just drive and park and then my daughter can walk to school, I can walk to work, she can walk to soccer on her own, I can walk to the grocery store, meet her back at the car, and then we can drive home at the end of the day. And we created two turning movements just by virtue of getting out of our cars in an environment that's dense. I didn't change the density. I did not change the density, at least on that view. I just put everything a little bit closer. I have halved the parking. I completely have the land area that's being impacted. I have only a fraction of the arterial trips that are created on that roadway. Only 25% of what I would have otherwise contributed and only one-sixth of the turning movements, which are the things that cause delay, and overall reduce vehicle miles of travel, which reduces environmental impact. Because we did the land use in a way that is clustered, in a way that you guys can do, in a way that is appealing to people in big communities and small. A farmer's market, a place to go. Everywhere I go, 
places are looking at how they can make their downtowns work like this because it reduces traffic, it reduces expense, it reduces environmental impact. It also, by reducing traffic, makes people happier. This is Don Appleyard's oldest drawing from so long ago and it's a thousand percent true. When you don't have a lot of traffic, you have more friends, you have more acquaintances, you have more social interaction. When you have a lot of traffic, it completely drops and dwindles. And that's part of what your problem is in your village center. There's just a fear of crossing the street. So when you look at zoning, when you look at the rules that are out there, we like to look at something called the transect, which is a way of envisioning everything from a natural environment all the way to an urban core. You don't have an urban core, you're more like around here. We consider you a two, T3 to T4 on this um, smart zoning transect. And you know, what's nice is that you've also got this, right? So you've also got this really close. So this is sort of like what Sunderland is. There's these kind of environment, that's wicked cool, because you have both of those things within walking distance of one another. So back to the density argument. It doesn't matter where you study this. If you increase density, driving goes down automatically because of that animation that I showed you. And more importantly, there's a zone when you get to just as little as seven units an acre and up to 30, whatever, in this range, where you have this massive drop. You, you drop 50% of vehicle mile trips just by going as high as seven units an acre. 30 units an acre is like a city. Forget all these numbers, who cares? This is like New York City and Manhattan, I don't care about that. Just getting to here drops traffic in half. So what does that kind of stuff look like? Well, first of all, for perspective, most subdivisions in the entire country are something like this. They're about four units an acre. You don't have that, you have less density than this. You also don't want that because it looks pretty ugly, to be honest. This, this exceeds that seven. Half as much traffic, this is out of Longmont, Colorado. And you can see, you know, it's just normal homes. The big difference is they're a little bit closer. These are the types of things that New England communities are thinking about infilling in just the small zones of their downtown. This is horrific density, or is it not? This stuff plunges traffic generation and creates a community. I mean, you don't even need to get to this. 36 dwelling units an acre, it actually looks like the same stuff. They've just made it really compact. None of it is more than three to four stories. I only throw this out there to think about, because you have to think about this a little bit. One of the things that helps to save your community is not just allowing more front door parking, strip malls, and kind of large lot development. It's actually encouraging more people to develop in a denser zone that take advantage of what you have, which is really unique and very powerful. This is something that's great, um, great site out there called Residency. So this is your a quarter mile circle around your village center. You're about one unit per acre, though that includes a lot of fields and stuff like that. If I, if I drop that circle really small and you get down to the center, you're gonna get up towards that number of four already. This is Turner's Falls. They're at six. So they're already at least 40% less traffic generation up in Turner's Falls. It's something to think about as we walk into the exercises tonight because on one of these boards, we've put a map much like this that has all of your existing buildings and existing spaces in our study area. And, and we want you to be able to say to us, mark it up and say, I, I, I think maybe we should put something here. Some of the things we're asking you to put there are open space, right? You know, that's good. But also think about, this is fine, but it's a little spread out. It's also a little bit not as mixed as it could be. Think about those things. Because <clears throat> in the end, Part of the thought between both the traffic solutions, which we're gonna ask you to mark up over here, and the land use solutions has to do with making your town work better. Has to do with thinking about how development can not really change the character of a community. It can just help change how it performs. Simply by making it more compatible for more people, simply by making the aesthetic of that environment 
feeling a little bit better, simply by thinking more completely about what transportation is, and more importantly, how people will interact with that. And yes, it still does involve cars, but use them as the metal wall of protection to your sidewalks, so it's nice to take a walk in your downtown. Lots of places do this in paint. That's a good start. You could probably do a pilot project with the DOT in paint. A lot of places do these types of treatments at just new crosswalks. You could pilot that. You could say to us tonight, can we try something like this? Can we go crazy and try a mini version of a roundabout? Can we put in all the barrels and the cones and get everybody slow to just understand how it might work? Because trust me, everything in the world can get around a small one like that. And can you, more importantly, use any of those ideas as an opportunity for you all to come together and paint it with your kids? So um, I'm going to share some numbers about your downtown. Before I do that, I want you to remember what it was because it's sort of an interesting perspective. This is that same image looking towards the southwest. The bridge is there. The bridge exists in this view, but this is 116, or actually at the time it was Amherst Road. A lot, not a lot has changed in terms of buildings. I believe this image is in the 50s, uh, maybe 40s, late 40s. You'll notice this little thing right here. I called it out on this mass dot plot plan that's still available on the web today. Um, that's actually a nice little flagpole that you had right there, right? So what's interesting is once upon a time, everybody who came across the bridge just turned right and left on Main Street. They used 47. 116 was made to shuttle things down to UMass and growth and all that stuff. And it really like cut things up. One of the arguments was you needed to get to the bridge. And I understand that. And, and, and you know, it's what's happened. You know, that bridge has always been there. But we made a roadway that really drove the use of that bridge today. And I think how many, I was like, I don't, it's, it's something amazing, like at least 12 bridges, if not more, have been built in this location. So we uh, pulled together all this data about how traffic flows go, mostly based once upon a time, everybody was accidentally sharing their location on these, thank you. Now that you all have opted out, I can't get fresh data, but it's a couple of years old. But anyways, um, it would tell us that literally 75% of the cars on 116 have nothing to do with you or even Route 47. They're just blown through. Um, coming in from the west, they're coming from places like I-91 and through Deerfield Center, um, and just very few are bothering to turn on, uh, one, on, on 47. And in the opposite direction, um, it's even worse. Like that's like the volume of folks coming from that direction. They're mostly just trying to get out of town, mostly to 91. You have a, a major cut through issue that you're not getting rid of, unfortunately. That's the reality. What you can get rid of is things like crashes. Now, luckily, there hasn't been a fatality recently, but there has been a fatality or two here. Um, folks talked about that last time. These are mostly property damage type crashes, but it's because the roadway is too fast. It is also the volumes, for sure. These are some of the volume information. You know, these numbers here, so just so you know, um, the you know, mass dot, these are projections for what they might use in a future year when they did an initial analysis. That future year will keep going out. Um, we're, we've made the point over here that it's pretty close to recent counts. It's a little bit higher. They have a slightly conservative projection for the future. That's fine. None of these volumes, as much as these numbers look big, are even remotely a, a fearful thing on the actual intersection itself. It's still a two-lane road. You, need, you technically need one turn pocket. You might need another. And you might need a third for the bus that goes through. But if you were to keep your intersection the way it is today. But part of what we're also thinking about is could you instead do a roundabout? There was an initial concept that came out of an early study that said, OK, can we do something here? This isn't exactly that concept. It's similar to that concept. Um, you know, we've run turning movements and all this stuff. So you know, your current intersection can shrink only a tiny bit, um, mostly because there's large trucks that are going into the business just over there on the other side of, of 47. 
Um, and then in general, they'll be large trucks. But they can also maneuver on a roundabout like this, just that their rear wheels would hop up on that red zone, which is slightly mountable. But everybody else drives around in the gray zone. In the center, green, planted, whatever you want. So what is the advantage of going to a roundabout? Why is that even on the table? You've had a signal for years. Um, there's many major benefits to a roundabout that you'll see, this is coming from Federal Highway and everybody talks about it. Um, and it's really that number one bullet. Um, they, it doesn't matter where you go, less fatalities, period. And that's for two reasons. One, cars have to slow up to go through a roundabout. That immediately, as I said, is the thing that reduces crashes. But two, anybody walking across a crosswalk at a roundabout is 100% in a very visible low speed car yield situation, as opposed to waiting at a signal where cars are going by and something bad may happen if an anxious car turns across a crosswalk. That's the biggest reason. They also happen to work pretty well for traffic volumes, and in this situation, slightly better than a signal. So that's another reason to be thinking about it. Uh, the one we're working on in Texas is the opposite because it's at the peak of its capacity. Folks are using them. Uh, this is downtown Sarasota, Florida, and they've had a lot of success with it. They've made some nice environments. There's another roundabout. They've got like six of these now in their downtown that you know, people like. It's not a bad tool. Small downtowns have been using them quite regularly. I recognize that there's some history to this for some places, though I would never design a roundabout like this. This is probably akin to the kind of design you might expect happening if that were to happen in your village center. This is the thing, or one of the things that's really important, and it's that at a signal, there's actually a lot of conflicts with pedestrians because you get cars from different directions going across those pedestrian crossings. And whereas with a roundabout, it's really just the cars coming from one direction all the time, whether it's the car exiting the roundabout or the car going in. It's that simple. There's splitter islands, so you break up the crossing. That's, that's one of the benefits and why, by reducing conflicts, you have increased safety. There's also a lot of design concern about roundabouts, particularly if you're visually impaired or in general. Um, visually impaired people hate them because most visually impaired folks, if they're going to cross an intersection on their own, they wait for the cars to stop, they hear the cars going in the other direction, or at your signal, everybody stops and they can tell. And there's a chirp on the pedestrian crossing and they know they can go. Um, at a roundabout, it's constant motion. Um, and when it's constant motion, visually impaired folks can't quite hear when the car is yielding because there may be other cars moving. So it's one of its downsides, if not many others, it's usually a larger footprint. Um, but you know, even if it's a larger footprint in here, so for instance, you can see on this intersection today, you can have plantings a lot closer to the core of the intersection and here they have to get pulled back. Also, the crosswalks have to get pulled back. They're not as tight to the intersection. That said, they're significantly shorter crosswalks because you're just crossing one single lane at a time. I am not telling you what you need to do in your downtown. I don't know the answer, but I am just trying to present kind of what some of these trade-offs are that a lot of communities are going through, and some have jumped on board and done roundabouts. It, just briefly from a traffic perspective, they're over here on the boards. Um, these future volumes that MassDOT included, which again are higher than are out there, but these are where the queues would go um, at the peak PM hour, pretty bad on 116. And a roundabout is better, you know, from a traffic perspective. But all those other factors need to come into consideration. They both have a, a similar average amount of delay. You'll actually notice that the average delay in a roundabout is a little bit lower even if there's queues because you're kind of in a rolling queue, which is one of its advantages. All right, outside of the intersection, the last thing to think about, and I'll stop, is the cross-section of the roadway. So 40, 42 feet out here, and it gets closer to 60 feet as you get in here. We need to think about this from the perspective of the entire corridor, not just the center. And so, as I said earlier, there's lots of space out there. You know, it may not be a cycle track, but you can put in, like they have here in many places, a nice wide sidewalk, much wider than you have today, that can also double as a multi-use path for bicycling, for instance. There's opportunities to narrow the roadway and think a little bit and make that even a beautiful experience, for instance, 
just by adding a complete feature that narrows up the space and uses some of that cross section. This is again that 75 foot right of way. There's the 40 feet roughly curb to curb um, up there. Here it is at the closer to the intersection where you've got the turn lanes in there. And you could just within that space of the curb to curb plus the right of way, think about changing things. You know, you could be adding in the bicycling. But you could also be adding in parking, for instance. There's nothing wrong with adding parking. You know, we need to think about what are the trade-offs. You have a lot of space to be able to do things. The roundabout, because you only need a two-lane approach instead of a left turn pocket, gives you even more space to do things with. We're always two lanes all the way up to the intersection instead of adding that left turn pocket. In both cases, though, you have room in the right of way to do more. So given all of that, now it's time for you. Um, on these boards here, we have in the back, and folks have already started, a board that's asking you, what do you like and what do you dislike about these two approaches to your intersection? But we're also asking you, what about all the other mobility things over here? I hope tonight you understood a little bit about what we're thinking through ourselves. Now the future is going to change, right? And I think one of the things that's happened that's quite evident to me in your village center is that you haven't changed. You've kind of just let things happen. Um, you know, you look at those historic photos and somebody built a community. Somebody built a lot of buildings. They built a crossroads. They created a center with a flagpole. They built the place, right? Um, a lot of those historic buildings are still there. There's not a lot of new buildings. The only thing that's changed is that the region grew. And you, you kind of took it on the chin. You, you got a bigger road. You're getting more and more traffic. Um, you know, at some point you, you got to say, okay, this is still our place. We're here. And I'm just trying to suggest to you the types of tools between mobility and land use that might be an opportunity for you to say, okay, we understand the region is growing, but let's do it on our terms. Let's do it at least for this quarter mile or half mile stretch, make it be something that works for us and how. So we're going to listen to everything you have tonight, everything you marked up, and then hopefully um, you know, we'll come back to you maybe late spring with a plan that you've created, hopefully that looks pretty good. So um, I don't really want to take any questions for the room. If there's any like big questions, I'm happy to take them. I mostly want you all up on those boards, marking things up. I'll be over here. Noah will be over there. Folks from the committee will be everywhere and anywhere. Um, I want to say a quick thanks to everybody who we've been working with on the Village Center Committee. Um, and certainly, of course, Jeff, thank you. This has been a good process to date. It will only get better with your help and assistance. Thank you. Come.